Malcolm X was born in America during the Jazz Age, a time of rampant racism, a time when African Americans were treated as second-class citizens and had few opportunities for advancement. Early in his short life, Malcolm worked at a variety of menial jobs, eventually turning to a life of crime. He spent years in prison. Then he converted to Islam and became a voice of hope for many African Americans even today. From criminal to charismatic leader, biography looks at the life of Malcolm X. Malcolm became uh, one of the lowest forms of human beings you could become, according to his own testimony in his autobiography. Before he reached his 21st birthday, he was locked up. Our forefathers weren't the pilgrims. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock was landed on us. We're talking about a guy who uh, began his adult life as a hustler doing every kind of drug available in the streets of Harlem, sexually promiscuous, a true sinner who purified himself through a religious conversion. When they are being brutally and unjustly attacked, then the Negroes themselves should take whatever steps necessary to defend themselves. When he spoke, he struck home to the crux of the matter. He'd hit you with the truth just like someone would hit you in the head with a blunt instrument and butt your head open. We must have separation in order to be equal. We must have separation in order to have freedom. We must have separation in order to have justice. What is your real name? Malcolm, Malcolm X. Uh, is that your legal name? As far as I'm concerned, it's my legal name. Would you mind telling me what your father's last name was? My father didn't know his last name. The last name of my forefathers yeah. was taken from them when they were brought to America and made slaves. And then the name of the slave master was given, which we refuse, we reject that name today. You mean, you, mean to... you won't even tell me what your father's supposed last name was or gifted last name was? I never acknowledge it whatsoever. Although he did not acknowledge his given name in later life, he was born Malcolm Little on May 19, 1925 in Omaha, Nebraska. He was the fourth child of Louise and Earl Little. Earl was from Georgia, Louise from Grenada. Earl, a Baptist minister, worked in construction to feed his growing family. Malcolm's childhood was heavily influenced by his parents' involvement in Marcus Garvey's black separatist movement. Garvey preached that to survive, blacks must form their own nation outside the United States and separate from whites. The Garvey movement largely represented blacks who were not professionals, not largely lawyers and doctors, at least they were not prominent so much. They certainly reached down to get the masses of black people who were not in the mainstream largely of the African American community. The Ku Klux Klan was then powerful in the North. In Omaha, the Klan threatened the Littles before Malcolm was born because they were Garvey organizers. Rather than fight, Earl moved his family over the next three years, first to Milwaukee, then Indiana, finally settling in Lansing, Michigan in 1928. By then, Earl and Louise had four boys and a girl. Despite the dangers, Earl Little continued his work as a Garveyite. He didn't have a permanent church, but he was a preacher. So he traveled from place to place, promoting Marcus Garvey movement, the separatist movement, and at the same time trying to preach the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He saw no conflicts between the two. Now Malcolm used to travel with his father as he would talk about Garvey and talk in the churches about Jesus Christ. Malcolm learned to love the talk about Gave, but he didn't like so much the talk about Jesus Christ. Settling in the industrialized Midwest was a good idea at the time because Earl could find work. He and Louise had their hands full caring for their growing family. Malcolm's rivalry with his brothers was contentious at times as they competed for their parents' attention. Life was not easy for Malcolm and his family. 
but his father's hard work and preaching put enough food on the table. Then the Depression changed everything. In Lansing, Detroit, uh, Grand Rapids, places like that, the, the loss of jobs for African Americans was devastating. Chances are, if you were black, you were poor. In 1929, their family home burned to the ground. Malcolm's father believed the Ku Klux Klan was responsible, but there was no proof. Earl Little built a new house, a tar paper shack with no running water, no indoor toilet. Earl gave each child daily chores, some in the garden, some in the house. He was a tough father, beating his children if they didn't follow his rules. Malcolm's mother and father uh, were violent in their relationship to each other. Malcolm talks about his father, you know, expressing the frustrations that he experienced in the society, in the context of the family. And that created a great deal of tension within the family. In fact, Malcolm claims that uh, it was from the fight between his mother and his father that led his father to leave that day he was killed. In 1931, when Malcolm was six, Earl Little died. He fell or was pushed off a streetcar in the middle of the night. His left arm was crushed and his left leg partially severed by the rear wheels. Although officials said the death was accidental, Malcolm believed his father had been killed by the Ku Klux Klan because of his separatist views. But Malcolm never talked publicly about his father's death. This particular experience left the family destitute, and so Malcolm grew up in a very uh, difficult situation in which he had very little reinforcement for his self-esteem in the environment in which he lived. In the 1930s, none of the seven children had enough to eat. Stale bread, wild onions, and dandelion leaves were often the only food. At school, Malcolm ate alone, rarely joining the other kids for lunch. For Malcolm, going to a predominantly white school, for example, uh, feeling uh, alienated from the dominant culture, uh, feeling as if he really had very few friends and his white friends pretty much shunned him, uh, that could have deep psychological effects uh, on, on Malcolm. He was tall, handsome, red-haired, light-skinned, different even within his family. Much of the color symbolism was reflected in the context of that family. Malcolm's mother uh, was very light complexion and so she, uh, Malcolm's father, was a very dark complexion man. So uh, the children were mixed. Some were dark, some were light. Malcolm was a light red very much like his mother in color. So his mother was hard on him. She wanted Malcolm to get in the sun and put some black on him. Malcolm became a troublesome child after his father's death. His mother found it hard to supervise her family alone. Though Malcolm was a good student, he became a disciplinary problem and he was moved from school to school. But despite all that, in the seventh grade, he was voted class president. Years later, Malcolm realized this was his first experience with tokenism. Being the only African-American or one of a few also makes you an exotic. He did get a lot of attention uh, and people noticed him wherever he went. Um, it was also, it's also an unusual situation to be uh, not only young, black, uh, poor, in a predominantly white community, but to be as, as intelligent and, uh, and as articulate as he was. Uh, which made him, in some respects, an automatic leader, even among his peers. Because his teachers found him so hard to handle, in the eighth grade, Malcolm was placed in a white foster home in Mason, Michigan. The authorities thought new surroundings would calm him. Soon, he was first in his class, but his desire to achieve, to be somebody, quickly faded. In fact, when he was in the eighth grade, the incident that forced him to drop out of school, embarrassed him, made him feel like he was not important, was when his teacher asked him what he wanted to be when he would grow up. And he said he wanted to be a lawyer, an attorney. And his teacher 
I said to him, Malcolm, you have to be a little more realistic than that because you can't be that and a nigger at the same time. Being a lawyer is no realistic expectation for a nigger, he said. He became disheartened and quit school. Malcolm was 14. It was the eve of World War II. Though the Depression was ending, life was still hard in America, especially for blacks. Malcolm's mother, Louise, was pregnant with her eighth child. The father was unknown. She was increasingly losing touch with reality. After her son was born, she was found wandering in the cold of winter, her feet bare, her baby boy held tightly in her arms. Louise was declared legally insane and committed to Kalamazoo State Hospital. Malcolm now had neither mother nor father to guide him. He could not be just like the white children and thus being shown in many ways that he could not be accepted just like anybody else. And this tension grew in Malcolm so much so that he dropped out of the dominant society. School had no meaning for Malcolm. Teachers could not discipline him. He sometimes stole. But something new was on the horizon. His half-sister Ella, a daughter from Earl Little's first marriage, came from Boston to visit the family. After she returned home, she asked Malcolm to stay with her over the summer. She knew her half-brother was having a difficult time and took it on herself to save him. But Boston opened Malcolm's eyes. Boston was the big city, and he was treated by his peers immediately as a kind of country bumpkin, backwards, uh, young. Um, and one way to escape that country baggage was to enter a kind of cool subculture, in this case of the zoot suit, of the hipster, a kind of underground, predominantly male youth culture that was raging in the late 30s and early 40s. After the summer, Malcolm returned to Lansing, where his family was still struggling to survive. He felt isolated and sent Ella a letter saying he wanted to live in Boston. She told him he was welcome. By February 1941, he was back in a city that would change his life forever. After the death of his father, his mother's confinement in an insane asylum and his increasing loneliness as one of the few blacks in East Lansing, 15-year-old Malcolm was anxious to return to the predominantly black Roxbury section of Boston. Once there, he gave his sister Ella more problems than she could handle. She literally went around the streets looking for him, you know, because, uh, you know, he came to Boston, you know, like he was a country boy. And he, of course, had to do a lot of ducking and dodging because there were a lot of relatives who lived in Boston at that time. And he just, you know, just became completely dazzled by everything and wanted to get out there. <laughs> Malcolm wanted to be like the blacks at the dance hall, the ballroom hall. He wanted to be like the blacks who were not ashamed of who they were and who live in the underworld. And he became a part of it. When you go to a place like the Rosen Ballroom, for example, they were packed full of young people, men dressed in zoot suits, uh, young women who sort of identified with the hipster culture. Malcolm bought a colorful zoot suit. Then he took the painful, fashionable step of conking his hair, straightening it using lye, raw potatoes, and eggs. He was starting a new life. Though Ella wanted him to be a lawyer to go into business, Malcolm's thoughts were elsewhere. After years as an outsider, Malcolm had finally found a place where he belonged. They embraced him because when he was articulate, they embraced, embraced him because he um, ended up being a, a very good dancer, uh, he was stylish, he was able to put, put on a suit of clothes and look like a changed person, a brand new person, and step out of his background and into kind of uh, a, a whole new world. Part of that world was the inner sanctum of the pool hall, the hangout of hustlers, hipsters, budding crooks, and small-time criminals. I used to play pool in this pool room every day. And Malcolm had a reputation in Roxbury at that time of being one of the best dressed men in town. 
with the, the famous Zoot Suit. And uh, he was standing on the sidelines watching the fellas shoot pool. One day in the pool hall, Shorty Jarvis made a great shot and in the excitement lost his watch. And I looked at Malcolm and I said, you didn't see it, did you? Because he was a newcomer. And he had a smirk on his face. And I walked up to him quick with my hands in those days, grabbed him and I drew back to hit him. And when I did, somebody grabbed my arm and said to me, no, he didn't take your watch. Somebody else got your watch and they're gone. Now I was in the process of apologizing to him, straighten out his shirt, man, I'm sorry. Uh, I falsely accused you and so on, so on. That was the beginning of our friendship. Despite the fancy clothes, to survive, Malcolm had to take what he called slave jobs, menial work open to blacks. He worked as a kitchen porter on the New Haven Railroad, bussed tables, swept floors. In nightclubs where he met the big entertainers of the day, Malcolm shined shoes. The jobs gave him money to eat, leaving him time to develop his skills as a petty criminal. Malcolm was, in my opinion, a beautiful con artist. He was a thinker. And he learned these things from street smarts, I call it, from living on the streets and being around people in the hustling world. He could meet you on the street, as I've told it many times, and be broke and talk you out of your last two dollars and you'd give it to him with enthusiasm. Working on the railroad allowed Malcolm to travel freely and often between Boston and Harlem, New York. Now Harlem was the capital of not just the hipster culture, the capital of the black world. And so going to Harlem for, for Malcolm was uh, like going to Harlem for a lot of African Americans. It was entering the most exciting place you can possibly be. Malcolm, already part of Boston's subculture, became part of Harlem's thriving underground economy. He moved into pimping, steering white men to black prostitutes. During World War II, Malcolm was a petty stick-up man, ran numbers, sold marijuana. He frequented jazz clubs, was a small-time pusher, and used every drug he could find. Clubs where, where jazz was performed were places of exchange for uh, drug dealers and users. And so the whole world that surrounded Malcolm was also one infested with drugs. And so it was hard for him to escape that possibility. In spite of the lure of Harlem, Malcolm always returned to Boston, to Roxbury, where he was admired for his flashy clothes and his charismatic personality. It was like a Romeo. And I say that, the girls were all after him. He was the type of person that when he walked down the street, he would command attention. With that blood red hair he had and with that zoot suit on, the girls were all in love with him. During Christmas 1945, Malcolm, in constant need of new thrills, went on a spur of the moment robbery spree in Cambridge with Jarvis and three white women, one of whom was Malcolm's girlfriend. We went out stealing for two weeks for a fun kid. Somebody in the gang said, oh, let's go out and break in somebody's house for fun. Being adventurous as young people like to be. We certainly wasn't doing it for money. We were making our own livelihoods and our own rights. So for fun for two weeks and after two weeks we stopped. Malcolm was eventually arrested when he attempted to buy back a watch he had pawned. The gang was caught, indicted, and tried in early 1946. Malcolm and Shorty could not make bail and were kept in a cage inside the courtroom. Jarvis said the detectives and prosecution were furious that white girls were socializing with black men. They tried to get the girls to say that we had raped them. The girls wouldn't hear that because they knew better. They sentenced the girls to five years uh, in a reformatory and gave them a suspended sentence and set them free. But Malcolm Little, not yet 21, and Malcolm Jarvis were given up to 10 years in prison. We were not hardened criminals. We didn't feel that we deserved that kind of time as first offenders. So we were given that time 
mostly because of our associating with white girls. It was very difficult for Malcolm not to be put in jail and not to get trouble in trouble with the law because of the context of the world in which he was living. And it was in prison that his life was transformed. In jail, Malcolm made a pact with Jarvis that they would learn everything they could and not come out, in Jarvis's words, as stupid and dumb as we went in. Life in prison was like nothing they had ever known. The cell you lived in was six by 12. You had a, a, a hard cot to lay on, one table, one small stool, a bucket of water, no running water, and a bucket for defecation. It was unsanitary, unclean, and filthy. So with years of time on their hands, the two friends sat, studied, and read long into the night until their eyes burned. Malcolm educated himself, sharpening his skills as a debater and speaker. While he was in prison, Malcolm's brothers, Wilford and Filbert, had become members of the Nation of Islam, a small black separatist movement in Detroit led by Elijah Muhammad, a one-time follower of Marcus Garvey. Malcolm's brothers urged him to convert saying they'd found a religion, a way of life that offered survival. At first, Malcolm resisted. Then he relented. His life was transformed. He saw Christianity as the white man's religion, as the religion of black people who wanted to become like white people. But here in the black Muslim, the nation of Islam, he encountered a religion that reinforced his identity as a black person and enabled himself to love himself as a black person. He didn't have a particular love for white people. And they used to call him Satan at one time because they thought he was evil. A lot of white inmates especially used to call him that. In 1952, after six and a half years in prison, Malcolm Little was released on parole wearing a $10 suit. He moved to Michigan to be with his older brother Wilfred. In Detroit, he would once again transform himself. After six and a half years in prison, Malcolm was released in August 1952. He went to Detroit where his brother Wilfred found him a construction job. He joined the Nation of Islam's mosque he worked hard to gain acceptance, to earn his ex, his new name for his new life as a black Muslim, to replace the slave name imposed on his forefathers. Malcolm soon went to Chicago, the headquarters of the Nation of Islam, where he met with Elijah Muhammad and officially became Malcolm X. His religious conversion was complete. It is an about face, a complete turnaround a totally new life in which Malcolm, who was the criminal, now becomes a minister in the religion of Islam. When uh, Malcolm came out of prison, the Nation of Islam was a, uh, a quite isolated little sect of about 400 souls. He would tell Muhammad, uh, you've got to bring this message to a much larger audience. So he became a recruiter, one who went out and fished as he said, for others to become a part of the Nation of Islam. The Negro will be serving notice that no longer does he believe in turning the other cheek and being the constant victim of someone else's brutality. The message of Elijah Muhammad was clear. The Nation of Islam did not need white people or white society. Black self-esteem came first and with it the establishment of a separate country inside the United States for blacks alone. Failing that, blacks should be allowed to return to their African homeland. We are African and we happen to be in America. We're not American. We are people who formerly were Africans who were kidnapped and brought to America. Our forefathers weren't the pilgrims. We didn't land on Plymouth Rock. The rock was landed on us. The message was always, this is a racist society. 
white folks are not going to res rescue you. Forget about the civil rights movement. Forget about the civil rights legislation. You will never get real freedom and recognition between black and white people in this country without destroying the country. Without it was a message that terrified white America and was too extreme for most black Americans who saw the more moderate civil rights movement growing. In 1954, in Brown versus the Board of Education, the Supreme Court said public schools must be integrated. In 1955, Rosa Parks started the Montgomery bus boycott by refusing to move to the back of the bus. Martin Luther King Jr. at 26 began his rise as a leader in the push toward integration. The Negro citizens of Montgomery, Alabama will return to the buses on a non-segregated basis. Meanwhile, the Nation of Islam struggled to win converts. Malcolm became the chief evangelist for the Nation of Islam, and he would go from city to city with great success. As a reward, Elijah appointed Malcolm head of Temple 7 in New York, and he became the national representative for the Nation of Islam. And is regarded uh, very highly as the number two person in the nation of Islam. And it will be being regarded as the number two person that will eventually lead to all kinds of jealousy within the movement. Elijah regarded Malcolm as a son and told him he should marry for the good of the movement. In January 1958, at age 32, Malcolm wed Betty Saunders, who had gone to college and was planning to become a nurse. They moved to a small house in East Elmhurst, Queens, owned by the Nation of Islam. In November of that year, Atala, the first of their six daughters, was born. Malcolm was a caring father, a good husband, but he was almost never home. His missionary work and message came first. Blacks have been deprived for hundreds of years. It's time to take a stand. In the areas of the country where the government has proven itself unable and, uh, or unwilling, to defend the Negroes when they are being brutally and unjustly attacked, then the Negroes themselves should take whatever steps necessary to defend themselves. Because of Malcolm's efforts and his personal charisma, the movement was growing fast. Malcolm was very easy to grab hold to because Malcolm was John Wayne. Malcolm was all the things in the movie that we saw about our heroes. Our heroes didn't take nothing from nobody, and they always had the best lines tall, lean, handsome, uh, magnetic, a brilliant smile, a uh, dazzling smile. Malcolm was everywhere. He debated on college campuses, made speeches on street corners, appeared on radio and television. The more Malcolm saw of America, the more his philosophy began to change. For Elijah Muhammad, the movement was strictly religious. Allah would be the one that would punish the white devil. Malcolm, however, did not want to wait on God. It was the start of the rift between Malcolm and the Nation of Islam. But there was something on the horizon that would widen the split further. Malcolm discovered that Elijah might have fathered as many as eight illegitimate children. He thought if the story got out, it could seriously hurt the movement. He called fellow ministers he trusted to warn them of the danger. All three of the people he told immediately blew the whistle on him, called uh, headquarters in Chicago and said, uh, Malcolm is blaspheming against the messenger. He was the object of a lot of jealousy, so I think those people were motivated partly by jealousy. One of them was uh, Louis Barakon. Malcolm's finding out that Elijah Muhammad was actually the biggest hypocrite of all was quite devastating to him. It took the very foundation upon which he was standing out from under his feet. His access to Elijah became limited. He was rarely quoted in Muhammad Speaks, the newspaper he created. But despite his problems, Malcolm continued preaching the gospel of the Nation of Islam. Give us a chance to solve our own problem 
uh, among ourselves on some land of our own instead of continually trying to force us into white society where the white society knows we're absolutely not wanted. Now Malcolm did not see how you could get freedom for African Americans by trying to be like white people. He did not see that whites would ever accept us fully as human beings. So for him, he didn't see why it is that the civil rights movement fought so hard to be integrated at the lunch counter for a cup of coffee because he felt that a cup of coffee was a small price to pay for 250 years of slavery. As the civil rights movement gained momentum, the Nation of Islam remained on the sidelines, unyielding in its dreams of separatism. Though Malcolm kept his religious faith, he was moving further toward political activism and inevitably toward a greater confrontation with Elijah Muhammad. Though Malcolm's differences with the Nation of Islam were widening, it was not apparent to outsiders. He was as uncompromising and faithful as ever. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that the only solution for the problem is that our people, of which there are now 22 million, be uh, involved in a mass exodus back to our own homeland. Despite but adhering to the party line, Malcolm became increasingly isolated from Elijah Muhammad and his inner circle. The assassination of President John F. Kennedy on November 22, 1963, gave the Nation of Islam a way to limit Malcolm's growing influence. Elijah Muhammad did not want anybody talking about the death of Kennedy. The reason being that he was a beloved figure not only in white America but in black America. On December 1st, Malcolm gave a standard speech. But in an unusual departure, he took questions. And his first one was about Kennedy's death. He said it was a case of the chickens coming home to roost was exactly what he shouldn't have said in terms of his relations with uh, Elijah Muhammad. So he, he had handed his enemies a sword. Elijah Muhammad knew that silence was his best weapon against Malcolm. He suspended him for three months. In January 1964, Malcolm had a secret meeting with Elijah in Phoenix and learned he had no chance for reinstatement. His ideas for the Nation of Islam had become too threatening to Elijah Muhammad's power structure. They didn't want Malcolm to succeed Elijah Muhammad as the leader of the movement. And the best way to do that was to make sure that Malcolm was marginalized and expelled. And worse, Malcolm began to receive death threats by telephone, by letter, and on the street. In March 1964, after three months of silence and much soul-searching, Malcolm quit the Nation of Islam to form his own organization, the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. He wants to join the civil rights movement to broaden its scope so as to make it uh, much more militant, infuse some militancy in it. Malcolm brought his new message everywhere with renewed energy. In Washington, during a hearing on civil rights, he accidentally met Martin Luther King Jr. for the only time. The two men merely exchanged greetings. In April, Malcolm delivered a major speech defining his new activism. The ballot is as powerful as the bullet. At least they're both important. And if you don't use the ballot, you're going to have to use the bullet. The Nation of Islam, continuing its purge of Malcolm, filed an eviction notice ordering Betty and their daughters to vacate their home. Malcolm and his family did not leave. Soon afterwards, his sense of religious mission drew him to a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for a pilgrimage to Mecca. It was a journey that would fundamentally change him. I didn't see any racism. I didn't see any conflict between the people over there because of the colors of their skin or the differences in color of skin. Many in America wanted to believe that Malcolm had modified his extremist views. What most whites wanted Malcolm to say and to do was to act as if racism had been eliminated and therefore I lack all white people. And Malcolm could never say that. 
1964, Malcolm formed the Organization of Afro-American Unity, created to reach out to blacks throughout the world as an expression of brotherhood. Unlike the other leaders of that time, Malcolm X had a foreign policy. He was treated in Africa when he traveled around almost like he was the Secretary of State, you know, from, from uh, black folks in America to the rest of the world. But to the American government, Malcolm was seen as a revolutionary. Malcolm was a haunted man and a hunted man. Agents of the American government, both of the State Department and the CIA, were monitoring his movements around Africa. He gets home and the climate is tindery hot. Inflammatory articles against Malcolm appeared frequently in the Nation of Islam newspaper, Muhammad Speaks. The most notorious was one written by uh, Louis Farrakhan and Louis X, who had been a protege of Malcolm's. Malcolm himself described it as, as a death warrant. In December 1964 and into January 1965, the threats continued. There were even several attempts on his life, assumed by some to be inspired by the Nation of Islam. I said, if you think for one moment that these brothers are not going to try to take you out. You're mistaken. But he knew he was hunted, and he knew his days were numbered, I think. In the early morning hours of February 14, 1965, his home was firebombed and destroyed. Except for a lucky stroke of fate, he and his family, including four quite small children and his wife who was pre pregnant with twins would have died. I really think Malcolm didn't want to die. I mean, he knew he was going to be killed. I knew he was going to be killed. Malcolm moved his family and continued his mission, making speeches in Detroit and New York. In the week following the firebombing, observers described him as being very tense. On Saturday, February 20th, the day before he was to make a speech at the Audubon Ballroom in Harlem, he checked into the Hilton Hotel in Manhattan. I think he enjoyed the, uh, the luxuries. He used to kid about it. He, he'd say, now I know what white folks have been hiding for, uh, from us all these years. Despite his going into hiding, threatening calls to his home and the hotel did not stop. Sunday morning, Malcolm phoned Dick Gregory in Chicago, wondering if he would be there for the speech. And Malcolm kind of sound kind of sad, but Malcolm knew something was going to happen, you know. And then I said, "I love you," and uh, I would have liked to say, "See you when I get back," but I knew better. Before the speech, Malcolm was making plans for a trip south later that week. I went backstage and I was talking to him, and I remember thinking for the first time that he really looked harried. He got to the uh, lectern. That's the traditional Muslim greeting. And I heard him say, "Assalamu alaikum. Somebody leaps up and says, nigger, get your hands out of my pockets. And then the next thing I heard was the shots. And when I heard the shots, I jumped up and I ran through the doors into the, to the main room. And I, you know, and it's, it just, it sounds to me like literally hundreds of shots. The first blast killed him, riddled his chest. And I heard, you know, people screaming and, sh and getting knocked down, and I got knocked down on the floor. Two more guys come up, one with a Luger and one, I believe, with a 45, and pump bullets into his dead body, his dying body. So I laid on the floor until I heard the shooting stop. Then I jumped up and I ran down and I jumped on stage. And I saw him, you know, laying there on stage, and someone had pulled his shirt open, and I saw the bullet holes in his body. At 39 years of age, on Sunday, February 21st, 1965, Malcolm X was assassinated by three men, all members of the Nation of Islam. He died for, for what he believed in. He believed uh, with his whole heart, soul, and mind in the struggle of the Afro-Americans in this country. One week later, thousands would attend Malcolm X's funeral in Harlem. People were stunned by his death. Black America had lost a powerful leader. Born into a life of struggle and uncertainty, Malcolm X lived as a hustler and pimp, then as a fighter for his people, and finally a man of God. But the controversy sparked by his death 
would ensure that Malcolm X would not easily be forgotten. Malcolm X was laid to rest in Hartsdale, New York on February 27, 1965. Throughout his life, he remained uncompromising in his expectations for African Americans. For 30 years, the legacy of Malcolm X has been as much a source of controversy as the circumstances surrounding his death. In 1995, the passions and doubts that have smoldered since that time were rekindled. Ever since the black leader Malcolm X was assassinated three decades ago, his family has been convinced that the Nation of Islam leader Louis Farrakhan was involved. Farrakhan was certainly a bitter rival, and today one of Malcolm X's daughters has been arrested and accused of trying to arrange for Mr. Farrakhan to be murdered. In 1965, Kabila Shabazz was four years old. She was in the Audubon Ballroom with her mother and three sisters, only a few feet away when assassins gunned down her father. Thirty years later, she has been tied to a conspiracy to murder Louis Farrakhan, the man who was her father's great rival in the Nation of Islam. Despite his violent opposition to Malcolm's break with Elijah Muhammad, Farrakhan has denied any involvement in the murder of Malcolm X. No. I was not in any way involved in his murder. I said such a man as Malcolm is worthy of death. And were it not for Elijah Muhammad's faith in God, it would have been so. I was very angry with Malcolm for what Malcolm had done. I was hurt by his assassination. I can't say that I approved and I really didn't disapprove, I was numb. The charges against Kabila Shabazz set off a bizarre series of accusations, conspiracy theories, and shifting alliances. Lawyers for both Ms. Shabazz and Mr. Farrakhan charged that a government informant lured her into a plot. Although Shabazz did not plead guilty, she also admitted that a statement she made last December where she said killing Farrakhan was her idea was substantially true. But outside of court, she disavowed the confession. But it was coerced. It was coerced. It was coerced. Now, instead of going on trial on charges that carried a prison term of up to 90 years, Shabazz is getting what amounts to two years probation. The surreal sequence of events culminated less than one week after the hearing when once passionate enemies stood as apparent allies. At New York's Apollo Theater last night, Betty Shabazz, the widow of Malcolm X and Nation of Islam leader Louis Farrakhan, tried to make amends after a 30-year rift. At a fundraiser hosted by Farrakhan to benefit her family, Mrs. Shabazz thanked her husband's one-time enemy for his support. It is an uneasy truce, but it is a measure of the impact Malcolm X had that three decades later, his death and his legacy are still capable of stirring powerful emotions. What did he leave? He didn't leave no buildings. You know, I say he left changed minds. And, and that's the most lasting thing. He was a field general in the movement. And he was loved for that. And, and, and he will be loved for a long, long time uh, for his ethics and for his integrity. The goal he had in mind was to teach our people to rise up in this world, to defeat racism anywhere it read its ugly head. My personal problem is never solved as long as the problem is not solved for all of our people in this country. So I remain Malcolm X as long as there is a need to protest and struggle and fight against the injustices that our people are involved in in this country. Malcolm X led a life of continual change and growth. Spent the final years of his life struggling to find his spirituality. There was no doubt in the minds of his followers that he was headed for greatness, perhaps public office. But when Malcolm was murdered, his dreams were left unfulfilled. But his teachings endure, and his life story continues to inspire.